Pizza will be provided, so if you want to encourage people to come out, that's March 13th at 6 p.m. So please, the refreshment table is open, and we'll get started in a couple of minutes. God bless. I'm going to have Pam Newhart come up here to uh, talk about her apparel that's for sale over here in the corner. I just wanted to uh, let you know that I do have a lot of things discounted here. You make it to 10 or $12, and then the regular prices are 22 or 2 for 40 I do have one shirt that says Project Street Fight, and that is a homeless um, project that I started. 100% of the product probably profits go directly to buying things for the homeless that are out of the norm, like uh, plastic for their tent floors, tarps, stakes around uh, rope, that kind of thing. So uh, that will go, all proceeds go to, to the homeless. But everything else is, I'll just explain it to you as you come up. Thank you. The table is right over there by the floor. Thank you. 
to things that I think you're really going to um, appreciate by the end of the evening. Um, as the pastor said, I'm Pamela Jacques, and I'm going to give you a little bit of my history and a little bit of um, history to what I'm going to be doing tonight. And first of all, I'm going to say three words. This is audience participation time. I'm going to say three words, and I want you to just remember what you think when I say these three words. I'll get back to those. First word is fly. <laughs> Second word is water. And third word is love. Okay, I'm going to come back to that. I currently uh, am a counselor. I've been a counselor for over 20 years, and I've been an artist for a lifetime. I was born that way, and uh, that will never change. And I currently work at Greaterford State Prison, which is a very interesting job. I'm a counselor in the mental health units. And so I have the opportunity to work with people and interact with people that most people would never in contact with and it's a very interesting job in that regard so I, I appreciate what I do and I, I actually enjoy what I do most of the time it's hard work it's very stressful work but I really do enjoy it quite a bit and what I'm going to be talking about this is something called transforming truth imagery and this is something that when I was a counselor many years ago already I was always interested in creative modalities and helping people. Helping people to experience and being an artist, always recognizing the power of image and the power of beauty and the power of the things that God tells us through creation. And if we just, we only have to look around us and the word says that in creation we see God, we come to know God because of creation, because of what he's teaching us. And so it's through the image of what we're experiencing that we come to learn a lot of lessons. And it's through the image, the Imago Dei, the image of God, that we came to learn who God truly is and what our relationship to him is. And so image is a very, very powerful thing. And I'll go so far as to say that we cannot do anything without first seeing it. And even God did that. He said, in the beginning, let there be. And in the beginning, let there be. And tells us that that was his intention. He's giving permission, let there be. But he had to know what he was going to see and what he was going to say. And he'd say, let there be light. But he had to have a picture already of what light was. He couldn't call it into existence without knowing what he was calling into existence. He couldn't say, let the day separate from the night and have his intention without being able to see what does day look like separated from night. 
So all throughout that first chapter of history that we look at, the first chapter of the creation story, we can see there's intention. God said his intention. God spoke it. He declared it. And he declared it into existence. And so as a counselor and as somebody that works with people who are often struggling with things sometimes they don't even have words for, it becomes very, very powerful to help them resolve their challenges with an image. And so I started to do that, and it started with me. You know, a lot of times our um, circumstances and the things we learn best are things that happen to us personally. And for me, I became very, very ill sometime in my life. I had a, had a series of tragedies very quickly back to back. And I became very ill as a result. Too much stress. You know, when you're under too much stress, your adrenal glands don't work right, your immune system goes to pot, and you, you just get very sick. And that's what happened to me. And so wrestling through those things, and being an artist, trying to find a way, how do I heal? How do I get better? I don't want to stay like this. I wasn't willing to do that. And so I've had two times in my life, both with physical illness, that God used the power of imagery and the power of creativity to bring healing to my life. Wrestling out the things with God. Uh, we all do it, we all suffer. We all things happen to us that we don't expect, that we don't want to have happen, things that hurt. And so therefore, in that process, in that wrestling, and looking at what was going to help myself, I had to start to picture, really, first you have to start where you are. You have to first be able to admit where you are. So I was able to admit and draw a picture of where I was, and I had two pictures that were primary. One was a broken heart, and one was a picture of myself um, lying down, and I would have brought it, but it, it's, it's so old now, and it's a little decrepit. Yeah, it's having some issues, so it was great. But I was lying flat on the ground, and all the joy, all the yellow was like flowing out of me, and there was all this black covering up my body, and all this red in my heart. And red for me is a color of anger a lot of times. I've come to learn that about myself. So this is my picture, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm, I'm reading, and trying to figure out how how do I change this? Okay, this is where I'm at. I have a broken heart, and I'm really sick. I'm so sick, I'm laying on the ground, I can't even get up. I can't do anything. And so God gave me this picture. And I set my intention. The first thing I had to do was become very, very intentional about what I needed. And I needed to see myself different. I needed to see myself not how I felt at the moment and not how sick I was, but I needed to see myself from a different perspective. And I asked God to give me that perspective. I need something. I'm, I feel like I'm dying. And so this is the picture. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this picture really big because I want to remember it. And so I'm in the studio and I started to paint it. And the, this was the first part I got, this iris. And I was so happy because this is one of my favorite flowers, these bearded iris. And I think they're so they're so beautiful and they're they're fragile and at the same time they're strong. They have vulnerability and yet there's there's strength. And their roots are deep. They go deep. If you ever pull out of mouth, they have like all these really crazy roots. But they're close enough to the surface that they still receive the air and the sunlight. And they still see what's going on around them. They still know and see. And then the cloud came into the picture. The storms. The storms of life came into the picture, and I had a lot of storms at that time. And normally, I, how I had been feeling, the storms were like way up 
appear over my head and pushing me down and pressing me down. And they were so heavy, I was laying on the ground. But I saw the storms now here, and the storms were watering the roots. And so all that struggle, all that battle, all that pain, all that suffering that I was experiencing, I was able to see it as something, it could be good. It could be helpful to me. It could be strengthening to me. It could bring about more strength and more growth because I needed that water to grow. And so when I, once I started to be able to see what I was going through from that kind of perspective, things started to change. And then the rainbow came into the picture. And for me, rainbows are very significant, and, I, and that's a whole other story, but rainbows are extremely significant because they mean covenant. They're promises that don't get broken. And we need promises that don't get broken. Because right here, in this world, we have a lot of things that get broken. So once this happened for me, and I started to get better, and I was a counselor at the time, I wasn't working, and I was able to go back to work, I started to wonder, wow, if this is something that worked for me, is this something that can help somebody else? Is this something that maybe somebody else can benefit from? So I went to several of my counselees, and I said, be my guinea pigs. Would you please come and do a test group with me, and I just want to try this out. I just want to see what happens for us, and if this is helpful to you, and if it's something that you feel is going to be useful to you. So I gathered a group together, there were about six of us that would meet on Saturday mornings. We did this for several months. They were so gracious and came to my house every Saturday morning for about three hours, and we did these workshops. And we just went through all kinds of issues, went through all kinds of situations, all kinds of beautiful drawings. The, the work that came out of those times was just amazing. And these were not necessarily artists. I want to clarify that very, very clearly. These were not artists, all of them. Some of them were very talented but and were very creative people. Others were not. You only need a stick figure. You don't have to be able to paint or draw for this to be effective. Because what happens is you see the perfect picture in your mind. And that's all you need. You don't have to be able to draw or paint. But some of them could, and we would get together then and process the work. And things would start to happen in our sessions. I'd start doing one-on-one -on -one with people. I did it in this group for several months. And it was a very amazing time where we were able to see things start changing and people start to get breakthroughs and people start to experience things that they couldn't before. And do you know why? Because unless you can see it and you bypass your head that just thinks about it, it's not going to change. It has to come from your heart. We can know everything we need to know. But if we can't be what we need to be, because we feel that, and it comes from our heart, nothing will change. Um, it's a lot of times, and I do believe very strongly in, um, in just the word just went out of my head, Okay, I can't remember what I was going to say as far as the, the word, but I do believe in talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. I was thinking of the letters and I couldn't what I meant. Cognitive behavioral therapy. I do believe in that very strongly. I use it with people a lot. I talk to inmates all the time. But it's got to be more than that. It's got to be, it's got to be heart stuff, not just talk stuff to really make a difference. And so that's why this works. This is why it's powerful. People put things on their paper from their heart. Because when you're drawing, now you've bypassed your head. You've just gone right 
pure heart and the intellect. And so people put things on the paper that they would never talk about. And then they start to talk about what the drawing means to them and what it looks like and what the colors mean to them. And those are things that are so different than they would experience just by talking about it. So it's a very, very powerful means of getting to the, the, the uh, core of a problem. And things come out a lot of times that they're very surprised about. I'm going to do you, I'm going to do for you a picture tonight um, that comes out of a story that I recently wrote. And I love to write and I love to um, just create stuff, you know, whatever, create creative things. I love to do that. But um, I'm meeting with a, 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 a small group right now, and some of them are here. Thank you very much. Um, but I'm meeting with them, and we had to write stories and for one of our homework assignments. And so I've written this story, and it wasn't a couple weeks later then um, I was asked to come here and do this. And I was like, I already know what I'm going to say. <laughs> so that was really great, because I already had the story about it. And the story involves a judge, and I draw on my work like a lot of people do when they're, when they're working. So the story involves a judge, and I'm going to first read what a judge is supposed to be, okay? I'm highlighting the paper here. This is what a judge is supposed to do. The judge presides over trials and hearings in federal, state, and local courts. They rule on admissibility of evidence and monitor the testimony of witnesses and settle disputes between prosecutors and defense attorneys. When standard procedures do not already exist, judges establish new rules based on their own knowledge of the law. They must ensure that all proceedings are fair and protect the legal rights of everyone involved. <clears throat> judges often conduct pre-trial hearings to determine if the evidence warrants a trial. In criminal cases, they must decide whether to hold defendants in jail pending trial or to set bail and other conditions for release. Judges instruct jurors about their duties and advise them of applicable laws. If defendants are found guilty, judges pronounce sentences. They determine verdicts in cases without juries. We need judges in our courtrooms. We need honest judges. I work and, and meet with people every day that the judge gives them a sentence. And that judge decides by the evidence that is before him what sentence that person should have. That person should have. And so that person's life is now governed, yes, by their actions. Absolutely. They are not exempt from their choices and their decisions. But they're also governed now by the sentence that the judge has given that person. Unfortunately for us, sometimes, and a lot of times with people that I work with, we also have judges. But sometimes they're just judges in our own minds. And sometimes there might be an actual judge in your life, might be a friend, might be a spouse, might be a brother or sister, a mother or father. And you might still hear things that that person says in your head. You know, we, we all do self-talk. So sometimes that voice is loud, and sometimes it's silence. Sometimes silence speaks louder than words. Sometimes people don't have to say anything, but in our mind, we're thinking what we believe that person meant by what they didn't say. And we all do it. You know, how many times have you, have you thought about something and you thought, oh, I really know what that person's thinking, and, and it wasn't what they were thinking at all. And so we, we can have this running dialogue, and a lot of people I work with have those kinds of running dialogues, and then because they are guilty of crimes, they do, you know, have this running dialogue. But a lot of times we're not guilty of any particular crime. But yet we can walk around sometimes feeling like we are guilty 
and we have the voices in our head and we have things um, maybe it's a self-confidence issue maybe it's a problem with just feeling like you you're doing things well enough you know that I'm not good enough mentality all of those things come into play with this uh, if you were neglected then you have the, the running thing in your head, well, I'm not important, nobody cares. You know, I'm not worthy of love, kind of things. So in my story, we're going to go into the story in a minute. I'll take a minute to put my paints out first. Um, and judges in the real world are very, very powerful. So they're very strong, very, like, you know, your image of a judge, big. They are respected and their sentences are always quoted. When I, I read sentences every single day. And they're always quoted with the honorable so-and-so. They never talk about a judge without that. The honorable. And they introduce them that way. So judges hold a lot of power. Sometimes in our lives we give that judge too much power. We give that judge too much opportunity to sentence us and to tell us things about ourselves that may or may not be true. So my story is going to be involved in this. And I want you to think now back about your um, the words that I said in the beginning. And think about the word fly. And some of you might have thought of the little bug fly. And some of you might have thought airplanes. Some of you might have thought you yourself flying. But I, I guarantee you have some image that represents flying. Think about the word water. Some of you might have thought of the spigot. Some of you might have thought of waterfalls. Some of you might have thought of streams or rivers or oceans. The image comes first. The image with the word that you're describing is what creates the power for you and what you're thinking. That image is very, very important in how you're responding to things. And think of the word love. You might have thought of a child. You might have thought of a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a brother, a sister. But when we think about these things, it's not just from a head place. They come from the heart. And so it's very important as you're, as you're talking about things and you're recognizing um, the power of imagery and what it conveys to you, what it means to you, that that same power can be used for you to heal, to change you, to declare things for other people. God said, let it be. Declaration, intention. And those things are very, very powerful for you to be able to bring things about in your own life. When I had Lyme disease uh, several years ago, and I was very, very non-functioning at the time, extremely. My, my route to healing was through a dream that I had had, that God gave me. And he gave me a picture of myself, and, and I was in a state where I couldn't move. If I moved, the only way I didn't have pain is if I, stood, if I laid perfectly still. And if I moved at all, I was in pain at all. It hurt to turn off a light switch. And... I had a dream one night and I was dancing in this bright yellow dress and I was twirling and jumping and I was doing all these things that my body at the time couldn't do. And it was that dream and that image and my continual declaration of what I had seen that helped me be able to, to get back and heal from that devastating disease. Constant. There were many pieces. There was a great naturopathic doctor. There was years that went by. It wasn't instant. 
I wasn't one of those types of humans. It took years. But I will never forget that. I still can see that dream. And that that was what I held on to. I'm going there. That's where I want to be. Not laying in my bed where I came. So I'm going to transition. I'm going to give you a few minutes to get something to eat. Take a, a few minute break. Let me get my paints out, and then I'm going to be for you and, and tell a story. I had a little bit of a technical difficulty, and I need somebody to be willing to read just a part of the story. I'll read the first part. I need somebody willing to read the second part. You will? Okay. All right. All right. Let me sit on my paints quick. Take a, a minute break. And we'll go right into it. <laughs> okay, on the inner Welcome, everybody. I'm just uh, excited that Pam's here. We try to give a little door prizes while uh, everybody comes out. We thank everybody for coming out. I'm first looking for a heart on the back of the chair. And I know Steve was sitting at the table. I had the chair. So you were sitting in the chair that I bought a while. So you win this crossword puzzle about the truth of the Lord. And the reason why the heart is on there is because of Jesus is love. The second one is a shamrock. Now I know somebody Who's it is? It's a shamrock on the back of your chair. <laughs> the closest one to it is Cheryl. And she's going to be getting Bible blessing and promising coloring art <laughs> for adults. Okay, the cat days, like the pastor said, is the one, uh, first Friday of every month. Uh, next month is going to be, I think it's the first, April Fool's. No, really, first. <laughs> so it'll be on the first. It'll, to be announced, look on the website or our Facebook page. And um, I would just like to take a little offering or just like a, uh, the refreshments and for Pamela, a little love offering. There's baskets on the table. If uh, you want to just place your offering in the baskets, and we thank you. And Pamela will be up in a little bit. Yeah. 
Okay. I had a little bit of a technical difficulty before coming, so I'm doing a little improvisation, which is exactly I'm going to read the first part of the story, and then I'm going to turn it over to my assistant, who's going to read the second part while I paint. This is the story. Of Ileana and the judge. She is brought, no compelled, by herself to come before the judge. The door to the room is wide open and easily enter. The room is large with towering walls which feel trapping. The walls are covered with emblems of battle and graffiti text speaking. Ileana had been in this courtroom many times. As a case against her is built by each new occurrence which appears to reinforce that the shadow watchers who fill the room are murmuring. Not good enough, little work, no true talent, abandonment, betrayal, neglect, that's what you deserve. You must somehow hurt to receive love. You will never have enough. Your dreams are not going to happen. Murmuring, murmuring, murmuring. Numbing sounds of whispered assaults. She was so used to hearing them. Sometimes they were as white noise behind the daily ticking of hours, days, and years passing with symphony of the live stream. Sometimes she could hear the melody of her days, and other times she only heard the murmuring louder than her own heartbeat. As an actor learns their lines, she had learned the script so well that the shadow watchers didn't often need to speak. She had not yet realized she had available to her what she needed to rewrite the whole story. This day, she felt summoned by the judge. He was already seated, waiting for her when she entered the room, feeling very small and panicked. Her heart was beating wildly inside her chest. What have I done wrong this time? What punishment is necessary? What blame? What shame? Question marks swirled through her being as she struggled for breath, coming through the door to take her place before him. He looked at her from a high place, filling the space with his power and strength. I must stay very still, she thought. Maybe he won't see me. Maybe he won't hear me. Maybe if I'm quiet, I won't get hurt or sentenced. The greatness of his presence drew her toward him, and as he saw her, he locked his gaze. His eyes are black pools of oblivion, and an abyss waiting to flame. His gaze felt like it penetrated her very being, seeing her heart now wrapped in iron lashings to protect it from this encounter, from the encounters with the terrible shadow watcher. He was a mass thickly cloaked, recanting imposed transgressions. She trembled, fearful. If he rumbled, he may crack the foundation she was standing upon, and she would fall away into forever darkness land. The room appeared to sway under her feet and her stomach with it. He was watching and waiting for her to draw ever nearer. She didn't want to look at him. But reason to stare in spite of attempts to divert her own, blame, her own glance. She wondered, maybe it's better to look at that which I fear. The judge did not need to speak out loud, but she could hear him through her soul, which felt shrinking. As she continued to stare at him squarely between the eyes, a most unusual thing started.
and have no sentence to serve. The dove then comes to go directly in front of you, intently and intentionally embracing you, within his behavior. With a look like sunrise, and sardines, the heart became so warm, the bands which bound her were loose and swept. The room was transformed to a beautiful chamber filled with brightness and glory. The walls were now covered with prismatic color, reflecting the image of the everywhere. She never went to leave that moment. This was love. This was love. All was worth. The dove spoke to her, saying, She must go, tell others what happened. He placed a beautiful jewel in her hand, saying, She had treasure to give to others. If she would pull out her view to them, they would see the same view she was now seeing. She didn't understand. How can they see when they are not here, she asked. The dove replied, because the view, life and wonder is now in you. When he said that the jewel, when he said that, the jewel seemed to melt into her skin, leaving an exquisite mark upon her hand, which glowed from the He also gave her a white feather, saying, Take this with you. And enjoy the light of your memory. I am always.
Does anybody have any questions for Pam? Thank you. 
Amen, Amen everybody. Amen. Let me go and get Pam on the other hand. One of the goals of uh, the cafe is to bring different venues, artists, music, that, you know, into the cafe so we can minister to the community, community, not just to have another worship service. We want to bring creativity. And we're blessed with one of the things that we're, le we're learning and I'm learning is we're, we're praying into the seven mountains intercession. And one of them is arts and entertainment. And we're, we're praying that God would raise up people to flood Hollywood, right? Amen. Amen? Yeah. In the music department, in, in politics, and all these wonderful things. And I've been meeting, going to uh, Third Heaven Worship on Thursday night, and that's what we've been praying into. Praying into specific uh, areas because we know that, that, that um, Hollywood movies and all that are being flooded by many ungodly things so we're raising we want God to raise up people to flood Hollywood and get in there and make some good movies and we're seeing it we're starting to see it God flood the music industry families we're praying for families all these different seven mountains that we're specifically praying for so we want to continue to uh, have this kind of um, creativity uh, come in and minister to people. Amen? Amen. Amen. We just thank God for his goodness. And Lord, we just thank you for tonight. Thank you again for Pamela for coming and minister to us, Lord God. And, and Lord, we thank you for the creativity. And Lord, you know, it's wonderful that we're unique and different. And you created us that way. And that we can minister to you in different ways. I'm, I'm called to be a, a pastor and a preacher. And that's and my giftings are in those areas. But Lord, you've gifted her in this area that can reach many people that I can't even reach. Lord. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we don't want to think sometimes that people, you know, sometimes we think if they don't act like us, talk like us, walk like us, then they're, they're strange, right? We don't want nothing to do with them. Right? Don't we act like that sometimes? You know what I mean? But we thank God for the creativity. Amen. So, Lord, just bless this evening. And we just ask you to continue. If you want to stick around, there's uh, shirts over there that you can purchase. Please stop by the table. And if you got any questions for me, come see me after the service. God is doing a wonderful thing here at New Birth Life Church. And we just thank God for his grace. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Blessings to you. Blessings.